Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our final impact training in the building. Oh. Y'all supposed to do that? Oh. <laughs> Where's my Cox thing? You press the button, and the lights all go on. <laughs> I thought it would be fitting to end the impact training with what started with George. The Phenomenon of Man was a project done by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He was a Jesuit priest in um, France, I believe it was. I was doing some research and I found a recording of him. And he was this little old Frenchman and he had this little French accent as he was speaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, too bad I couldn't mm -hmm. use him. And he's not the voice on this video. So there's a video that came along with um, the book that I'm going to hand out. Yeah. All right. So this book that you have. This is based upon Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's work. So, this video was made a very, very, Sorry. very long time ago. It is very, very slow. <laughs> so I tried to break it out as much as I could so that we're not going to all <coughs> fall asleep while you're watching the video. So there's no graphics and animation and woo bells and whistles. It's pretty much, it actually is just a slideshow that was converted to a video. So you won't hear the little beep as the slides go, but they'll just kind of dissolve. So if you go through this book, you actually can follow along with the slides, but I want to just give you a word of caution. The people who built this video skipped slides because they kind of tried to not make it be so scientific. By the time you all leave here, you're going to feel so intelligent and so smart mm -hmm. with all this scientific information in your head, <clears throat> which can be a little overwhelming for some people. Mike Evans will probably love this. <laughs> if you're mental, you really like this um, presentation. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give you the book. Therefore, you can follow along. <clears throat> the gentleman's voice is actually quite clear as you're listening to it, but he has a very meditative voice as you're listening. So it really is easy to drift off. I have yet to make it through this entire video without losing consciousness. Mark did, but I'm sure he spaced out a couple times. <laughs> So um, I just want to set that up for you. <clears throat> Therefore, in between there, you'll notice that there's four different books. In between the books, I'm going to break in and do some PowerPoint slides and let you guys take a break. As a matter of fact, I brought popcorn so everybody can have something to munch on while you're watching this, but I'm going to hand that out a little later. <clears throat> Anybody familiar with the phenomenon of men except for the um, old timers here? So I'm looking at movies. Nobody? Excellent. All right. So. I'm just going to start with a clicker. The Phenomenon of Man is introduced by a gentleman called Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, he's essentially just known as Teilhard. That's what he looks like. He was a Jesuit priest, as I said before. He has a lot of quotations that I like, so I thought I'd put a couple of his on. Our duty as men and women to proceed as through the limits of our abilities do not exist. I think that's beautiful. A lot of these things correlate to George and his philosophy as well. Mark, can you? Oh, these are down. Okay. Um, Pierre Teilhard, he was, uh, here we go, born in 1881 and died in 1955. He actually died in New York City. Um, he was a French philosopher, a Jesuit priest, a paleontologist, and a geologist. So that's uh, quite a different combination. The Jesuit priest, had a philosophy, I'm going to see if I can remember it, it was find God in everything, very similar to a Buddhist, so find God in everything, so he really set forth with the idea, since he had such a scientific mind, he wanted to combine science and religion, which is very unique, most of the time science and religion are combating each other, and uh, Teilhard wanted to tackle the task and make it be science and religion united. And through his work, he actually was able to accomplish it. So the phenomenon of man, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, this afternoon. The phenomenon of man, this is the book based upon his work. So in general, the synopsis of this book, it's the universe is constantly developing. We are all constantly developing towards higher levels of material complexity and consciousness. 
a theory of evolution that Teilhard called the law of complexity and consciousness. Essentially, he said, the more complex we become, the more conscious we become. So as we grow in our complexity, our consciousness also grows. Now the question you have to ask yourself is, what does consciousness mean? Is it, I'm just aware of what's happening, or I'm aware of universality, I'm aware of our connectedness? There's many different types of consciousness, which I'm not going to go into. I want to just connect this to the law of complexity. If you think about today's society, we have a very complex society. The internet is everywhere. Like if you could see the internet in like the matrix, if you could see that, what you would see would be lines shooting everywhere. Hi guys, there's seats up in the front. Sorry, there's only one book you guys have to share. <laughs> so the, um, with all the internet, if we could see it like the matrix, that's what we would see. That's the amount of complexity that we have. So Teilhard theorized that as more complex as we begin to evolve, our consciousness begins to expand as well. His idea is eventually consciousness and our complexity, complexity would unite at one, so we would have a moment of expansion and awareness at the same time, just like that. There wouldn't be series, which we're gonna talk about as we go through this. His other work, he's known for two very famous um, works of art, of books. The next one is called The Divine, and I don't know how to say that second word. Milieu. Milieu, Milieu thank you. So this one, the synopsis is, Christians should, do, should be committed to whatever work they were doing and offering it up to service of God. So remember, a Jesuit priest is trying to tie religion and science. So he was making the connection that everything we should do would be offered up to God. Now in the Jesuit religion, it would always be in service to God. But he actually got in trouble <laughs> with the religion. So there were some contradictions that he <coughs> presented and therefore was not in alignment with it. But he, so his term God didn't necessarily match the Jesuits' picture of God. He was looking at God as an expanded consciousness uh, of unity. That's what he was looking at. Um, George used to call it the collective consciousness. So as we have a collective consciousness, he would say everything that I'm doing is offering up to the collective consciousness. Instead of me being beneficial, it would be beneficial to everyone, everything. Humanity is essentially what he was going to. So the law of complexity, I briefly tapped on this for a minute. So what exactly does the law of complexity mean? Well, in the definition, if you actually did this on Wikipedia, it refers to Teilhard. It's postulated tendency of the matter becoming more complex over time and at the same time becoming more conscious. So over time. And that's what we're going to look at. When we introduced, or when George introduced the idea of the omega point, which is what inspired George for um, omega here, we talked about the idea, those of you who have been through omega-4, there was a, a graph that we used that through the length of time, eons and eons, not eons, billions of years pass by and we have a minimal amount of consciousness because there wasn't much complexity happening on the planet. We were being born. But then as we started arcing up and in increasing in our complexity, our consciousness became equal to it, but didn't happen at the same time. So it would be compress, expand, compress, expand, compress, expand. And as I already indicated, Teilhard believed that the idea would be one day we'd have expand at the same time as compression, just like that. It would be instantaneous. Time essentially would not be relative anymore. So as I said, this is going to be pretty scientific. So one of the first things I want to introduce you to is the idea of entropy. This is what happens, the definition is, the measure of energy gradual de degeneration to a useless or unavailable condition. Nature's energy can never be destroyed, it's only converted from one form to another. So you never lose energy, it just moves from one to the other. For example, we could talk about death. Our physical body may not exist anymore, but the atoms still do. Uh, when George was cremated, I, I got this box of ash, essentially. Which, by the way, nobody told me there's still little bits and bones and pieces in there. That was kind of gross. I didn't expect to see bones. <laughs> so we have this little box, and his was a box, but you know, he was a fairly small man, so it wasn't a very large box. <laughs> and so when I spread his ashes out, they went back into the earth. None of the atoms changed. 
Most of our bodies consist of water. That's what keeps us pliability and fluid. If you drain all the water out of us, we end up being like that little box. That's it. So all those atoms will be sent back to the planet and recycled. Energy is different. Their vibration change. Your vibration is different because you have a living force within you. This has a vibration, but it's much different because it's not alive. This has a much different vibration because it, does, it has more density than a leaf. So there's not much flexibility as opposed to silk. So you'll notice that we have different stages, as I'm talking about right now, different stages of complexity. This is heavy, dense. There's really not much consciousness in this, in this podium. <laughs> then I have a little bit more fluidy, but there's still not much consciousness in this. We could say that the tree has the consciousness to have leaves and spread out and not just fall to the ground because it's got less weight, but it has no awareness of itself. It doesn't try to improve itself. It doesn't think, I want to get a better home. It doesn't say, you know, oh, I need the rain or the sunshine. I want to be by a window. None of that. It, so it has no thought whatsoever associated with it. So we can, yes, sir. I have a question about that. Oh, you God. I just it, started. <laughs> well, um, you said it doesn't, uh, let's take it from this tree to a living tree. Living trees grow towards sunshine, so don't they try to improve by Living trees that? have consciousness. Okay. This doesn't, because okay. it doesn't have life in it. Okay. It's a vibration, but it's not consciousness. Now, there are, are instances where trees, actually they say the largest living organism on the planet is the aspen trees over in Colorado, because they're all connected underneath. So it's considered as one organism. Oh, okay. So what makes us different from this and this is that we have life inside of us. And this is what Tara tried to explain, exactly what is life. It gives us awareness. It gives us um, thought. Reflective thinking is part of our lives as well. And so that's what we're defining consciousness. It's connected <coughs> to the life that exists within us. So we can look at this, this doesn't, it's wood, we can say wood used to be a tree, so that had some form of life, but this is really dense, inanimate object, the tables. Everything that you see is a result of a product that came from this planet, so we could say, technically, there was some form of life in it to give it structure, <coughs> but it doesn't have consciousness or awareness as a soul is what I'm going to say. Although a lot of the Buddhists, I see I'm going to get myself trapped up here because Buddhists believe everything have consciousness. So let me just let that get out of here. All right, so that's it. <laughs> alpha. Everybody knows the alpha sign. This is the definition. This is the beginning, the starting of all cosmic evolution. Somewhere at some place we began. Nobody really knows. There is the scientist who says it's the Big Bang. And their question naturally is, well, what went bang? Where did that come from? And then, of course, religion says it was the Garden of Eden. So there's the contradiction of that eventually, or equally, they're both considered the alpha, the beginning stage. And then naturally, where we're ending up is the omega, which is uh, the definition. See, is this going to this is going to keep you awake? <laughs> the focal point of the convergence of the material and spiritual world. So. Omega doesn't necessarily mean the end. Um, those of you who are around when we called delta vector, remember delta vector, Barbie should remember this. <laughs> so delta vector was the end, it was the transition. And George used to use the illustration of the river going into the ocean that was often called the delta. So delta vector is where you had the transition. That's why we called it the delta vector, it was the transition. Omega is actually the convergence point, the convergent point of material and spiritual world when we unite it, when we come together. That's considered the omega point. Now I'm going to pause here for a moment. Just because I'm delivering this stuff to you makes me no master on this information. <laughs> I'm just going to deliver what I know and what I remember from what George taught us in the years that I've worked with him. And trying to make it be less scientific and overwhelming for some of you, okay? That's my intention right here. So this can be quite overwhelming, and if you hang in there, you're going to understand towards the end why George actually was so impressed with this idea and why it inspired him to call Omega Omega as we go along. So that takes care of, uh, let me make sure that's the last slide that I have before here. No. 
Then we have the definitions. I'm going to give you two definitions from Pierre Teilhard du Chardin. Pierre said the without. There's two things that he held his awareness to. There was an out, a without, and within. The without is the physical exterior aspect of matter. So that's everything that I can see, hear, feel, touch. Anything with my <coughs> physical senses, that is the physical that's considered without. The within, therefore, is obviously the opposite of that. It's the spirit, consciousness, psychic energy, the interior aspect of all things. So something I can't quite put my finger on, but it exists. Something I can't grab hold of, but I know. It's almost like that force within me that moves. <coughs> that would be considered the within. So those are her, his two definitions. He had the within and the without. All right, now what I'm gonna do is introduce the movie to you. As I said, it's gonna be slow, so bear with it. That's why you have the book, so you can follow along. So actually, if you open up to page 13, that's where the slides begin. And remember, the book doesn't follow <coughs> every slide exactly. I'm not sure I'd make it that dark, Susan, a little bit lighter. The book doesn't follow the slide exactly, so there's some slides that are gonna be skipping, but at least you have the narrative right there so you can follow along with it. So what we'll do is we'll go through one book, we'll stop, do a little discussion, and then go through the other so that it's not so overwhelming information for you. So go ahead, Susan. Thank you. So while this is going, if you're just going to get some music and a heartbeat in the back, I'm just going to mention in the beginning of the book, you don't have to flip to this, I'll just say, um, uh, Teilhard was really <coughs> convinced that our universe and its history can be viewed rationally only if we assume that it exists both logic and consistency no matter what stage or area we choose to examine. He says, we live in a universe which is still evolving and changing, even after billions of years of development. So, that's the premise of how, why he started this work right here. Chart, 
marks the birth of life, the critical threshold crossed by evolution with the appearance of the first cell. Second, life itself. A time span in which there is a development from the first simple cell through the more complex cells, simple forms of life, such as algae, then fish, amphibia, reptiles, mammals, to ever more complex forms of biological life. The second vertical represents another critical threshold. That point in time, when with the first appearance of man, reflective thought is born. Third, thought. The development of man from the earliest forms of pre-hominoids up to present day man. The third vertical represents <coughs> the 20th century, today. And finally, the future or as Teilhard so aptly calls it, survival. Do we reach the present after billions upon billions of years of evolution and then suddenly stop evolving? Or if evolution continues, what does the future hold for us? Do we or can we become extinct? Is there a future? In this brief summary of the phenomenon of man, the various building blocks of cosmic evolution the elementary particle, the atom, the inorganic molecule, the organic megamolecule, the cell, and man will be represented by simple geometric symbols. The magenta dots will symbolize the dynamic interior aspect of all things, the within, or consciousness. The curved black line will represent the law of complexity, denoting the ever-increasing physical complexity of things in the long history of our universe. The curved magenta line will represent the rise of consciousness in the evolutionary process. We now see before us a symbolic representation of space-time. The lower left representing the very simple forms in nature, the upper right the very complex forms, from alpha to omega, the beginning and the end. To push any physical form in nature back in time is equivalent to reducing it to its simplest elements. Thus, when we attempt to trace man's roots back into the dim, distant past of cosmic evolution, we find ourselves exploring with the physicists the very elemental units that form the fabric of our universe. In reality, all matter is in a constant state of genesis. Our dynamic, evolving universe is a mass in transformation in which every part is enveloped in time, duration, and the process of becoming concentrated into ever higher forms. To better understand this vast evolutionary process, let us focus our attention on the very bottom layer. Over a sufficient duration of time, these subatomic particles collect together, pack in, and condense until they reach a supersaturated state. Finally, with the addition of one more particle, there is a change of state into the world of the atom. This process of matter evolving into higher complexities is the fundamental action of evolution. Thus far, we have looked at matter, the stuff of the universe, only from the without, viewing its evolution in terms of the law of increasing complexity. The physicist and geologist might tell us that this is all there is to evolution. But the biophysicist and microbiologist, working on the border between physics and biology, have reason to wonder about the implications of the spontaneity exhibited by even the most primitive virus and bacteria. The botanist finds it more difficult to assume that plants do not have some kind of interiority, or within, to use Teilhard's term. This same assumption becomes a gamble for the biologist studying the behavior of insects or the lower forms of life. It seems futile to disregard the within, in the higher forms of life, and impossible to ignore it 
when we reach the level of man in whom a certain interiority or within unquestionably exists. This within cannot be ignored since it forms the basis of all knowledge and is experienced by every man through direct intuition. The consciousness in man has a cosmic extension and as such is surrounded by an aura of indefinite spatial and temporal extensions. That is, consciousness exists everywhere throughout space and time. We cannot deny that deep within ourselves an interior appears at the heart of beings. That is enough to lead Teilhard to suggest that in one degree or another, this interior should assert itself as existing everywhere in nature, from all time. Many of today's scientists prefer to disregard the important inner aspect of man's consciousness. For them, it is an isolated and hence unimportant phenomenon in nature. But is this logical? Would it not be more logical and more in keeping with the consistency of our universe to suggest that in all matter, there is an inner aspect paralleling the exterior complexity and intimately interwoven with it. For Teilhard, the within, or consciousness, is a term to indicate in its fullest sense every kind of psychism from the most rudimentary form of interiority imaginable to the complex phenomenon of reflective thought which we perceive in man. Obviously, the consciousness of elemental matter and the consciousness of man are not on the same level. For just as there is an evolution of the exterior aspect of complexity, there is also a continual evolution of consciousness. In the less complex forms of nature, this evolution of the within represents the emergence of a continually increasing power to respond and perhaps can be best expressed in terms of spontaneity or freedom. To understand the nature of energy in its relation to the within and without of things, Teilhard divides the one fundamental energy of each particular element into two components. First, the external aspect of energy, which links each element with all other elements of the same complexity, such as atom to atom, mineral to mineral, or molecule to molecule. This is the tangential component. However, there is an internal aspect of energy which links center to center in a way that draws the elements onward toward ever greater complexity and consciousness. This is the radial component. In the earliest stages of evolution, Subatomic particles are drawn together by the tangential component of their energy so that in time each particle with its own particular center of consciousness intermingles and combines with other like particles <coughs> until under the influence of the radio component of their energy there begins a process of transformation. And with a sudden change of state a new form of reality appears the atom. True, this operation is very costly when viewed from the without, because every time something new is created, something is finally burned in its creation. There is an irrecoverable loss on the physical level. But in reality, this apparent loss manifests itself as a much richer consciousness, or within. The tangential or physical aspect of energy has been directly transformed into the radio or spiritual aspect which becomes the foundation for a higher consciousness. A similar change of state occurs when atoms converge to form the world of the inorganic molecule, giving it a far richer interior. Another transformation occurs when the inorganic molecules combine in the formation of organic molecules. Again, there is an increase of the within, which is manifested in a greater spontaneity. These organic molecules gather together, ultimately evolving into the first living cells. 
And with the cells, there is a tremendous increase of the within. In an evolutionary world, matter is continually being converted into spirit because they are the two essential aspects of the same basic reality. The law of increasing complexity must then be expanded into the law of increasing complexity consciousness. For with every step up the ladder of physical complexity, we find a corresponding increase of the within or consciousness. In adding the dimension of time to our picture of the universe, we see that we can no longer speak of a static cosmos. Rather, we are now dealing with a cosmogenesis, that is, an evolving universe. And we can speak of its history in terms of an evolutionary monism, and not the more traditional dualism of classic thought, which draws a sharp line between matter and spirit. In an evolutionary monism, the evolving universe gradually shifts its emphasis from the exterior to the interior, so that ever higher levels of consciousness emerge from the growing complexity of the world's exterior face. The universe will not find its stability and final end in its decomposition. The universe is not held together from below, as the laws of entropy imply, but if the universe holds together at all, it is from above. Something is not only drawing our universe toward ever greater complexity, but also toward ever greater consciousness. So far, we have been skimming over the diffuse and unlimited layers in which the stuff of the universe is deployed. Let us now focus our attention on an apparently insignificant event a tiny cosmic birth in one corner of a vast universe. It occurred some several billion years ago when a fragment of matter that was composed of particularly stable atoms detached itself from the surface of the sun. At just the right distance from the mother star to receive moderate radiation, this fragment, containing a certain mass of elementary consciousness, begins to roll itself up to condense to take shape. Matter is no longer able to spread out and diffuse at will. Instead, it coils up within the closed volume of a sphere. Yet this cosmic event holds far-reaching consequences, for within its globe is contained the future of man. So now we will restrict our further examination of cosmic evolution to this tiny planet. For it is the only place in the universe where we are able, so far, to study the evolution of matter to its ultimate phases. Let us then look at our Earth in its early stages, so new, yet charged with latent powers as it balances in the abysses of the past. The central sphere is the barysphere, the hot metallic core of the Earth, in which only the simplest forms of dissociated matter can exist. The surface of the barysphere cools to form a thin, rocky skin, the lithosphere. This is the crust of the Earth, womb of inorganic evolution, the world of minerals and crystals. The hydrosphere comprises the fluid layers of our Earth, in whose temperate zone water, ammonia, and carbon dioxide combine and group themselves in long chains around the carbon atom, forming ever larger and more complex combinations. This is the world of the megamolecule. The involution of matter, which formed the spheres of the Earth, causes pressure to build up on the various layers of complexity. This pressure brings about a competition for limited space. Thus it is, for reasons of survival, that matter on this planet has continually changed into higher and higher forms, ever more complex physically and much more complex spiritually. So, as we continue gazing into the abysses of the past, we can see the color changing. From age to age, it increases in intensity. Something is about to burst out upon the early Earth. And this something is life.
stop it there for a moment. So essentially what he did was just give you a basic fundamental explanation of, oops, um, a basic fundamental explanation of the law of complexity the different types of spheres that we went through. I want to just mention he said something about how things become crowded. It's the stress that's implied on a certain object that causes it to transform to the next level. So he went from um, cells to inorganic to organic. I'm sorry, it was inorganic to organic to cells to biological. So it, as the pressure increased, we went to the next level. So I wanted to start giving us a little bit of definitions here. Um, sorry, another quote. Remain true to yourself, but move ever upward towards greater consciousness and greater love. At the summit, you will find yourselves united with all those who, from every direction, have made the same ascent. For everything that rises must converge. So we think about this in an Omega classroom. Everyone in here has been through at least one Omega class in here. So. In the, John, you have, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> just checking. So everyone understands that on <laughs> Thursday, when you come together, there's a lot of stress and, y you know, the agreements are put into place and, ah! Well, people don't understand that below the underlying level of the agreements is to cause stress because that's what causes evolution. Mm -hmm. By increasing the complexity in the classroom, come Sunday, you don't feel stressed anymore. You feel united. As a matter of fact, the consciousness of the classroom changes because the stress, the element of the stress is there. That's an illustration right there of how George used Pierre Teilhard's work. By having complexity, you evolve. So by increasing the stress, we have an awareness, an evolution of awareness and consciousness. Now, a couple more definitions I want to do. He says, does evolution have a direction? Now, obviously, in the illustrations, he's showing me evolution is ascending. That's what he said. Our evolution is we're increasingly growing and striving towards something greater than ourselves. In the next section, we're going to talk a little bit about the tree of life. This is not the Kabbalah tree of life. This is a tree of life according to um, Teilhard. We have the plant world, then there's the insect world, and then, of course, the world of vertebrates. So that's the increasing complexity right now. We're stepping into biology now. So we're going to go into the different levels of the um, types of words that we have, worlds that we have. The peduncle, this um, I breezed over quite quickly earlier. I haven't said this word yet. When George introduced the word the peduncle, a couple of uh, one or two people were like, the what? <laughs> peduncle, what? <laughs> so the peduncle, it's actually a biological word. It means to go from one level to the next. That's all a peduncle means. So the actual definition is the beginning bud of a new phylum. Am I saying that right? Phylum. A new phylum, the beginning of a new species in nature. So as the increase in complexities come together, when you add one more, it goes through a peduncle and you end up having something else. If you know anything about um, the birth of a child, it's the cells they converge, divide, converge, divide. That's really what they're doing. So they're increasing and creating something else. So they go through the peduncle or the phylum. I just happen to like the word peduncle, so we're going to use that one. But that's what it means. So as you go through, and he said something is burned off. But remember, you never lose the energy. You just lose the form that existed previously. That's all. However, Teilhard mentions that with every peduncle that we pass through, our consciousness increases. So for every peduncle we go through, the consciousness increases. So our form changes and our in the inner increases as well. Is that all I had on that one? Just to make sure before we get to the next one. Yeah, that was it on that one. So I'm going to go back here. All right, so now he's going to introduce us and start talking about the, the actual idea of life as we know it here. So we're going to start off on page 26 if you're following along in your books. Go ahead, Susan.
Now picture the infant Earth a thousand million years ago, covered by a layer of water, volcanoes erupting, and the forming of land masses and continents. The world is ripe and fertile for the advent of the cell. To modern observers, it might have seemed completely inanimate. Yet upon closer examination, we would see the infinitesimal smallness and innumerable number of these sub-life, megamolecular forms. Life as it emerges from inorganic matter is dripping with molecularity. We have a sort of supersaturated solution with the Earth in a state of biological supertension. Yet the climb to life is a slow, deliberate process. For only after immense duration, when the conditions are just right, then suddenly, life in cellular form is born. The delicate physical and psychical structure which complexity consciousness had taken up to this point has changed state to better survive the crushing competition of its earlier forms. And it is important to remember that these changes occur on all levels of complexity for reasons of survival. So we have seen the elemental stuff of the universe transformed into atoms and atoms into inorganic molecules and megamolecules, and finally into cells. Life, as we know it, was born. Life advances by mass exertions of multitudes flung into action without apparent plan. The individual unit seems to count for little in the process. Let's look at life as it expands from a single cell. First, the living particle is wrenched from itself. Secondly, it is caught up in an aggregate greater than itself. That is, it is lost in number. Thirdly, it is absorbed in collectivity. And finally, it stretches out in becoming, transformed into something greater than itself. This dramatic and perpetual opposition between the many born out of the one and the one constantly being born out of the many runs right through evolution. Millions of forms jostling, shoving, devouring one another, fighting for elbow room and the best and the largest living space, survival of the fittest by natural selection and groping as a solution to survival. Yet it would be a mistake to see this movement as mere chance. Groping is directed chance. On the large scale, life may seem to be entangled in utter confusion. Or it might be considered a continuous wave from a single-centered origin. But no. Life branches. That is, it ramifies. It is arranged in tiers, classes, orders, families, genera, species. So life, as it advances, splits into natural living bundles called phyla. Each phylum is elastic and is a collective reality. It can be as small and simple as a single species or as vast and complex as a sub-kingdom. The tree of life is a well-defined structural reality. Each member is traceable down to a common origin. Let us see how, like a living tree, it develops and flourishes. Life, in its totality, from the very first stages of its evolution, is one single and gigantic organism, laboriously rooted in the abysses of the immeasurable past. Let's watch our tree of life as it grows. There are three major branches on this tree. One leads to the plant kingdom, Another leads to the insect world. And the third is the vertebrate branch. Below these three major branches is a tangled complex of non-skeletal animals and primitive one-celled creatures of the primeval slime. As we center our attention on this branch, 
we shall see it is the only one that leads directly to our target, man. Let's follow this branch through its earliest evolution among the protochordates into the world of primitive fish, and out of this, a new stem, that which leads to the mammal world. Life crawls out of the waters to breathe air and live on land. Such a transition must have taken place when certain forms of life, in order to survive the overcrowded seas, went through a process of mutation and became amphibian more than 200 million years ago. Then from the amphibia, the reptiles, birds, and the mammals. Each layer shown represents approximately 50 million years. At the very top, a poor tiny lobe will appear, a belated offshoot on the tree of life. In it, man will finally make his appearance on the scene, some two to three million years ago, a mere split second in the total evolution of things. Looking at this tree of life, we may well receive an initial shock, the sort of shock we get when an astronomer speaks of our solar system as a simple star, and of our stars as a Milky Way, and all of our Milky Way as a mere atom among other galaxies. So under the efforts of our analysis, life sheds its husk. From top to bottom, from the biggest to the smallest, each newly discovered form finds its natural place on the tree of life. The spontaneous arrangement of overlapping relationships, subspecies and races, larger species and genera, biotas, and to end with, the whole assemblage. Forming one single gigantic biota, rooted like a single stem, steeped in the depths of the megamolecular world, the living tree of life. What more do we need to be convinced that all this has grown? Yet to locate the area that shows outstanding growth of the within, let us look at the huge stem on the left of the tree, the chordate branch. This includes all those species that have developed a spinal cord. Here we find, from layer to layer, massive leaps in consciousness. There is a tendency in time for a development toward ever more cerebralized forms, meaning from form to form, from age to age, the nerve ganglions begin to concentrate. They become localized and finally grow forward into the head. So we see consciousness developing and concentrating in upon itself through the perfecting of ever better nervous systems and the formation and development of a brain. From the dinosaurs whose small brain was little more than a string of lobes on the spinal <coughs> nervous system, reminding us of the amphibians and fishes lower down, we pass into the stage above, the mammals. Here the average brain is much larger than in any of the other vertebrates. The brain then is the sign and measure of consciousness, for it is continually perfecting itself with time. The further back in time science establishes the origins of primitive animals, the smaller are their brains, the simpler their nervous systems. This then is our guide through the labyrinth of living creatures. Evolution has ordained that the mammals and their successors provide the dominant branch on the tree of life. And to its leading shoot, the primates, belongs the honor of bridging the eras of life and thought, the furthest extension of consciousness. Why the primates? Because in them, evolution went straight to work on the brain, neglecting everything else. In one well-marked region at the heart of the mammals, where the most powerful brains ever made by nature are to be found, they become red hot. And right at the heart of that glow, burns a point of incandescence. We must not lose sight of that line, crimsoned by the dawn. After millions of years rising below the horizon, a flame bursts forth at a strictly localized point. Thought is born. 
the primate becomes reflective. Reflective thought. 
So I am aware self-conscious, it means I'm aware of me, and reflective thought, the idea that I can think and reflect upon my thoughts and proceed forward because of my thoughts. So this makes me a far more complex creature than primordial slime. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the three building blocks. There we go. We have the atom, which for the physical world, so that's the building block for the physical world, so this is going to be a little review. And then we have the cell, so atoms transform into cells, and the cells are for the world of life. And then finally, the grain of the individual reflective thought, which is for the world of mankind. My little sentence got goofy there. But the grain of individual reflective thought, so that's the world of mankind. So that's a building block for me, is the idea that I have the capacity to think now. My brain is more complex than all of yours put together. No, I'm kidding. Our brains are more complex than the dinosaurs. That's what he said. Remember, the dinosaurs were just a couple of lobes on top of the spinal column. So with the complexity, it appears that with complexity, our brains increase. Then think about this. People who have very strong brains, aren't they very complex individuals? I'm going to try not to look at you people <laughs> who have very strong brains. You're very complex people because <laughs> you're thinking all the time. So that thought process makes you a little complex. <clears throat> then, the, oh, I wanted to go back through the various levels of the spheres on the planet. He kind of touched on it briefly, but I'm going to go through it. God bless you. I'm going to go a little bit more just to give us the idea of how evolution expands here. Curious, though, we're talking about a sphere. And he's going to talk about this a little bit more, too. Sphere and evolution. Being that sphere and evolution, everyone knows one of the four fundamental laws is gravity. So we have the weak nuclear force, where is decay, the strong nuclear force, where things bond together, then you have gravity, and then the electromagnetism. Those are the four fundamental laws. So on the sphere, the planet Earth spherical, all of these created our, our planet. So the, ba the Barry sphere, then we have the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, which he didn't mention, so I'm adding a couple more in here, the biosphere, and then Teilhard introduced something called the new sphere. The new, new, and I'll say it French, is it a new sphere? Noosphere. French fries, the newosphere? Noosphere. The noosphere. The newosphere. I'll say French fries. Like no, noosphere. A what? Noosphere. Why are you pointing to your head? Like no. There's nothing in there. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I know. The nose sphere. My nose sphere. Yeah, I'm going to butcher this one. All right, so I want to just introduce what the layers actually are. So obviously he talked about the Barry sphere. This is the molten lava in the center. It's very fluid, but not much consciousness happening down there. The definition of this is the heavy interior portion of the Earth directly <coughs> under the lithosphere. So it's the center. We could call it the core. God bless you. Surrounding that is the lithosphere. This is the, the crust, essentially, of the planet Earth. What it does, it's the outer part of the crust of the solid Earth composed of rock, which is essentially about 50 miles thick. So that's above the mantle, the, the thickness, and it's the rock. So it's stuff we can see on the surface. The gravel that you're kicking is part of the lithosphere. Beyond the lithosphere, next comes the hydrosphere. Hydrosphere has everything to do with water, so it could be the ocean, it's the, um, the cycle where things get absorbed back up into the sky and then it rains so it comes down. I forgot the name. What's that called? What's that cycle? Evaporation. The water cycle. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, it's, a, it's a specific meme and I don't remember exactly. But it's the layer of the water on the Earth's surface. So water, which is cells, atoms, has consciousness, but there's no brain that exists inside of them. So it's a limited form of consciousness. Yet without it, we cannot exist. So water has that cycle. That's on top of the lithosphere. Then we live in the atmosphere. The atmosphere extends far above the planet Earth. So it's 40 kilometers of altitude. That's how far up it goes. If you've ever been in a plane, as you high, the higher you go up and when you look up during the day, you'll notice how it starts getting darker at the top instead of lighter because you're going towards the sun. That's because the atmosphere is getting thinner, so it doesn't hold the light as much, so it starts looking darker. 
So these are the four or five different levels inside of our atmosphere. The atmosphere essentially are just the gases surrounding the Earth or any other planet. So that's the atmosphere. We exist in the troposphere, and the stratosphere is a little, well, some people's heads are in the stratosphere, but most of us exist just in the uh, troposphere. The ozone layer is actually, it, the la I think the ozone layer is what encompasses the very end of this. It's like the cap of the atmosphere. Then we have the biosphere. So this is the next level of evolution. The biosphere essentially is everything that's alive, every living thing, the realm of life, the layers of living things which forms a covering over the earth. The sphere of living organism, organisms contained within the lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. So this means things that are living in the, lith the lithosphere, rocks, I mean um, worms and insects, everything that lives in the ground, even our vegetation, fruits, I'm sorry, vegetables, whole well, trees are rooted in the ground, the two human beings, and then the things that live in the air. That's our biosphere. Has anybody been to the biosphere down in Tucson? Yeah. Have you, um, have you gone in it? Yeah. You did want it? Okay, so what was the experience like in there? It's really cool, Anne Marie. Who's that? There? It's, really, it's really cool. You so go, you, go from, you go from one <coughs> climate to another climate to another climate. They have all the various climates. That's what I was curious. Did yeah. they create like a desert and a yes, water, they do. humid they and dry? Do. Okay. And they've, they've redone it a lot. It's worth going. Um, I remember Nicole had told us this story years back of how one thing that they didn't expect when they planted the trees mm -hmm is that um, the trees would reach a certain level and then all of a sudden fall down. They couldn't figure out what was happening. Well, that's because they didn't have any wind to build resistance so the trunks could get strong. So once the tree reached a certain level, too much weight, the roots weren't strong enough, the trees would just keep collapsing. So that was one of the considered the failures of the biosphere. I don't know if they fixed that or not. Do they have trees in there? Yeah, they have wind. They have wind now? <laughs> yeah. And now they have, yeah, they have wind now. Oh, that's good. Okay, so the biosphere was an attempt to create another atmosphere. I mean, a, a biosphere, another living place, in case our atmosphere dies, we'd still be able to sustain ourselves. The biosphere is also the idea that we could take that and put it on Mars and actually live in Mars if we create something like that biosphere and it's successful. <clears throat> then the no-sphere. Xenosphere? So the no-sphere. <laughs> The definition, I'm just going to talk like Gandhi, it is much easier. <laughs> so here we have it, the realm of the mind and reflective thought, the layers of thinking creatures, humans who gradually spread over the surface of the earth. So this is a different sphere that he, Teilhard, came up with. The idea that there's another level of spheres that exist on the planet. Collective thought. So my thinking actually makes a contribution to the no-sphere. Your thoughts make a contribution to the no-sphere. Now, a lot of the Ageless Wisdom teachings talk about that. <laughs> <clears throat> I just got lost in train of thought because my flashing just went off. So, Ageless Wisdom teaching talks about thinking. We are responsible for our thoughts. I talked about this last Monday. We're res responsible for our thinking. If I understood the implications, when I have high vibration thoughts and low vibration thoughts, I'm making an impact on my surrounding. So if I think high vibration and speak high vibration, it increases the vibration. If I think low vibration and speak low vibration, it decreases the vibration and the experience around me. So if I could say that the no-sphere is like the biosphere, or above this biosphere. In the biosphere, everything that happens in there affects everything that's inside that captured realm. Well, if we could look at the no-sphere as a captured realm, every negative thought, every negative word, every negative action affects the entire sphere. Therefore, the Ageless Wisdom teachings talk about speaking, thinking, clearly, high vibration with positive not affirmation so much to say, but contribution, with a contribution to something greater than just me as an individual here. So the, that's the definition I wanted to go through with that. Teilhard said that we have two choices. We have only two choices, actually. Absolute pessimism or absolute optimism. If we are a product of our thinking, and our thinking is pessimism, our lives will be pessimistic, and they'll be on the decline. But if we have 
optimism, meaning not like we're all happy and cheery and isn't life wonderful? I want to knock those people's teeth in. But, did I just say that? <laughs> we want to have optimism always looking at the value, always finding value in things, to look at life and see the positive aspects, not just the negative aspects that we see. So those are the two choices that we have. He also said that our future is our own responsibility. So think about the weight of that. You are responsible the, for the future of humanity. I will say that again. You are responsible for the future of humanity. That puts a lot of weight on your shoulders, doesn't it? It, it would kind of make you awake thinking, wow, everything I think and do is going to affect humanity. That's a pretty heavy task to take on. So. Before I move on, I want to just check here. Yeah, let's just do a quick little break right now. I will continue to move forward. A couple of things he said was for growth and even survival to be possible, men must expand their minds, their feelings and vision to an extent wide enough to encompass a real awareness of the cosmic nature of man and of his role in the evolving universe. Nature is no longer a free agent because of the magnificent gift of reflective thought. So where nature was progressing on its own, on, on its own, now man, because it has thought, we can change things. Oh, I don't like the way the water's flowing that way, so I dig a trench and I redirect nature. I don't want my house here, so I cut into the mountain and redirect the actual mountain itself. So we are now manipulating nature. So nature no longer has freedom as we begin to express our own freedom here. Mankind has the ability to resist, shape, and enhance the process that has swept forward for um, ever since the birth of evolution. This is a very strong power. Wrongly used, it could lead towards our destruction. Need I say any more about the atom bomb? <laughs> we, as human beings, can now divide an atom and cause great destruction through our thinking. We can now cause harm. But if we were to go in the other direction, we have, which is what I talked about earlier, absolute pessimism and absolute optimism. If I could put my thinking into the convergence of humanity rather than the separatism of humanity, then we would be leading towards evolution. So we're going into this stuff earlier. Huh. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure I do the right quotes here. So then I have one more quote. Oh, no, I want to talk about love, but I don't want to do this yet. So let's go back to the video and do the next half of this book, because this is, we're still in book three. We are, at this very moment, passing through a change of age. Life is taking a step, a decisive step, in us and in our environment. After many centuries, the hour has finally come, characterized by the birth pangs inevitable in another change of space. There were those first men who witnessed our origin. There are the others who will witness the great scenes of the end. To us, in our brief span of life, falls the <coughs> honor and good fortune of coinciding with a critical transformation of the noble state. In these confused and restless zones in which present blends with future in a world of upheaval, we face all the grandeur, the unprecedented grandeur, of the phenomenon of man. Let us look carefully and try to understand the particular form of mind which is coming to birth in the womb of the earth today. From the dawn of his existence, millions of years ago, Man has been looking at himself and his world as somehow divorced from himself. Yet he has only just begun to take a scientific view of his own significance in the physical world. We should not be surprised at this slow awakening. For man to discover man, he has had to gradually acquire a whole series of senses. Let's take a closer look at modern man, who less than 500 years ago, conceived of the earth as flat, and the heavens as a vast ceiling with holes pierced through for the stars. Gradually, man became aware that he did not live on a flat surface, but rather on a sphere. 
Still, he did not fully understand, for he conceived this earth that he lived on to be the center of the universe, with everything in the heavens revolving around him. But man was in for a shock. With the coming of Galileo, this ancient geocentric view exploded, and he discovered the boundless expansions of an unlimited cosmos. The earth was seen to be a mere speck of sidereal dust. To us, it may seem incredible that man, indeed as late as the 18th century, felt perfectly at ease in a cubic space where the stars turned around the earth for less than 6,000 years. In a cosmic atmosphere which would suffocate most of us from the first moment, 18th century man breathed without any inconvenience. Between him and us, in the short span of only 200 years, what then has happened? Through the invention of the telescope, awareness of spatial immensity becomes possible. And so man kicks out one wall of his tight little world. And to balance it, the infinitesimal springs into view through the lens of the microscope. After the walls of space, it is the floor of time which is the next to give. Through the gradual discovery of evolution, man slowly becomes aware of the measureless abysses of the past. And conversely, through man's awareness of the infinite future, the ceiling of time will expand. Yet in these first stages of man's awakening to the immensities of the cosmos, space and time, however vast, were treated as two great containers, quite separate one from the other. It was only late in the 19th century that the light dawned at last, revealing the process of evolution. That all objects are born from their growing together, from a common beginning. Hence, all things are related to each other, regardless of their complexity. And thus it is that both space and time are organically joined again so as to weave together the stuff of the universe. The landscape lights up and yields its secrets. Man discovers that he is nothing else than evolution become conscious of itself. He sees that, that is the point we have reached and how we perceive things today. Step by step from the early earth onward, we have followed upward the great law of complexity consciousness. Now that we have reached the peak, we can turn around, look downward, and take in the pattern of the whole. The harmony is perfect. From top to bottom, from our souls and including our souls, the lines stretch in both directions, untwisted and unbroken. Man is not the center of the universe, as once we assumed in our simplicity, but something much more wonderful. He is the arrow pointing the way to the final unification of the world in terms of life. Man alone constitutes the last born, the freshest, the most complex, the most subtle of all the successive layers of life. Now it is impossible to find oneself in a fundamentally new environment without experiencing the inner terrors of a metamorphosis. Our mind is dazzled when it emerges from its dark prison. Awed to find itself suddenly at the top of a tower where it suffers from giddiness and disorientation. The whole psychology of modern uneasiness is linked with the sudden confrontation with space-time. Human anxiety is as old as man himself. Yet we must admit that the men of today are more uneasy than at any other moment of history. Conscious or not, suppressed anguish, a fundamental anguish of being, despite our smiles, strikes in the depths of our hearts and is the undertone of all our conversations. What threatens us? What is lacking? Space. This is the most tangible and thus the most frightening aspect. 
The malady of space-time manifests itself by a feeling of futility, of being crushed by the enormities of the cosmos. Time, sometimes having the effect of an abyss on those few who are able to see it, and at other times the despairing effect of stability and monotony. Events that follow one another in a circle, vague pathways which intertwine, leading nowhere. The bewildering number of all that has been, is, and will be necessary to fill time and space. The effort, for instance, of trying conscientiously to find our proper place among a thousand million men, or even in a crowd. Tomorrow? But who can guarantee us a tomorrow anyway? And without the reasonable assurance that tomorrow exists, can mankind really go on living and striving for a better world. Sickness of the dead end, the anguish of feeling shut in. Teilhard contends that that is precisely the ill that causes our disquiet. What makes the world in which we live specifically modern is our discovery in it and around it of evolution. And Teilhard now adds that what disconcerts the modern world at its very roots is not being sure that there is an outcome, a suitable outcome, to that evolution. After the long series of transformations leading to man, will evolution lead to complete obliteration? No. Man will never take a step in a direction he knows to be blocked. Either nature is closed to our demands for futurity, in which case thought, the fruit of millions of years of effort, is stifled, stillborn, in a self-abortive, absurd universe, or else an opening exists, an opening of the super-soul above our souls. But in that case, the way out, if we are to agree to embark upon it, must open out freely on the limitless spiritual spaces in a universe to which we can entrust ourselves without hesitation. We are confronted accordingly with two directions, and only two. Having gone so far, what are the minimal requirements to be fulfilled before we can say that the way ahead of us is open? First, that there is for us in the future, under some form or another, not only the possibility and hope of a survival on Earth, but also of a superior form of existence. Secondly, to imagine, discover, and reach this super-life, we have only to walk in the direction in which the lines passed by evolution take on their maximum coherence. In other words, where consciousness is at its greatest. To bring us into existence, the world has from the beginning juggled miraculously with too many improbabilities for there to be any risk whatever in committing ourselves further and following it right to the end. If the world undertook the task in the first place, it is because it can finish it following the same methods and with the same infallibility with which it began. Man must come to realize that he carries the world's fortune within himself, and that a limitless future stretches before him in which he cannot found it. The last analysis, the best guarantee that a thing should happen, is that it appears to us as vitally necessary. Quoting Teilhard de Chardin, only in support of hope, there are rational invitations to an act of faith. Have we the right to hesitate? say no I don't want to go on any further well that's pretty much what some of us do when we don't want to die 
we hang on to life. We do everything that we can that doesn't make us die. We eat healthy, we exercise, we take medication, we have operations. I'm not seeing anything is wrong with this. But it's our intention to extend our lives. And what would the point of that be, to extend our lives? If everything that we've been talking about so far is true, then the physical human being will eventually go through a peduncle and no longer be necessary for our existence. Eventually, we will exist in a different form, shape, whatever you want to call it, another vibration. So when we hang on to this physical body, what we're trying to do is suppress, suppress evolution. So that's something to consider. What is it that we can take with us once we pass on? The Egyptians thought that they could take everything. That's why the tombs were filled with all their gold. The gold was to pay the guy to get across the river. And then they could take all their possessions with them. They thought that was possible. Not true. But, well, I don't know. <laughs> I know George didn't take any possessions with him. All he did was take his last breath, and he didn't even take that. So he took his last breath, and that was it. The breath didn't even go with him either. So when we pass on through our peduncle, do we pass on with joy or fear? Now in this one, I feel grateful because I was there when George died. Saw him embrace death the way that he embraced life. It was beautiful. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen to watch him pass away. When it comes to that, he never thought about it's not a choice. He embraced death as much as he embraced life. He just knew it was the next step to go to. So I want to bring up the next uh, point from Teilhard. He talks about love. I know that throughout my history of facilitating, I've heard, and I don't remember where exactly I heard it, but I think it's connected to this, where in the universe, science is starting to call the force that bonds things together love. It's equate, it equates to love. So it fi it's funny to me that a scientist says it's love that unites cells and atoms together, but they don't have any other word to use. And so Teilhard, in his way, that's what he wanted to do as well. He said the only unit of force which can bring men together is love. I think that's true. When you have two nations fighting, it's love that brings the nations together. When you have families fighting, it's love that brings it together. Not anger, not upset, not greed, not disapproval, not right, not wrong, no evil whatsoever. It's just pure love. When we talk about in the classroom unconditional love, those are the highest forms of love. So cells, do they have jealousy and upset? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think all of that gets connected with my reflective mind and my possessions. So it's mine, not yours. The greed kicks in. My chocolate milk. Nobody knows that story. All right, so then, <laughs> point of convergence. This is what he calls the omega point, the point of convergence. In order to have the point of convergence, for men to unite in a loving union, there must be some focus <clears throat> beyond or outside the finiteness of individual men. Fight night of individual men. A center which at the same time offers a personal and loving focus for human convergence. So in order for me to be successful, for a loving union, it's got to be besides me. I can't be the focus of the universe, which, by the way, I am. But I can't be. <laughs> I can't be the focus of the universe. The focus of my husband's universe. <laughs> we can't be the focus of the universe. It has to be our contribution to the universe. And for those of you who remember George, his biggest phrase was to make a contribution to humanity. I remember when he had his first surgery. Susan and I was there when he woke up from anesthesia. And the sentence he says, he opens his eyes and looks around the hospital room and says, I've got to make a contribution to the citizens of this community. And then goes right back to sleep. Like that's his first thought out of surgery. <laughs> I've got to make a contribution to the citizens of this community. And then, boop, out he's gone. It was always there for him. It was always in his forefront. How to make a contribution, how to make a contribution. Never about him how to make a contribution. And I believe Teilhard really tapped into this with the idea of love, how it was the key of all things. <clears throat> I think that's my last slide, it is. So when it comes to love, I want to make sure I don't miss anything here before we go to the fourth one. Oh, the thing I wanted to talk about, how everything gets together and, and converging and when we're tight. Think of our planet today. We have more people on the planet alive than we've ever had. 
So our spaces are becoming more limited. Uh, even in the internet, our space is limited. Um, what, I don't know what you call them, you know, when you have um, how many big gigabytes you have to download stuff or how many space you could put out there. All of this is starting to get limited, crowded. They say that the number one thing right now are selfies, which makes me laugh. It's you taking a picture of yourself and posting it up so everybody sees what you look like. I don't get that. Everybody knows what you look like, but we have pictures of ourselves. This is me eating, this is me sleeping, this is me driving, like, okay. But selfies seem to be a big thing right now. And I think it's we're on the verge of a convergence now because the focus has been so much on us where we're missing out on the connection. Somewhere within the next, I want to say decade, decade or two, there will be, I feel, a shift of consciousness because we're getting so crowded right now. There's so much information right now. Patience is like so little right now because you just go to the internet and find your answer, boom. You don't have to think anymore. I was actually talking, I was actually talking to um, a client of mine and we were saying how it's funny Back in the old days, when you bought something, there was a cash register that you had to punch in and the cashier had to add up how much change you got back. They don't do that now. You know, they just punch in the number and the computer says give them back 236 or something like that. And the kids sometimes even can't even count 236. 236, that's a quarter and a penny. So they'll sit there and like try to figure out how to make 36. Ever. A lot of people <laughs> wanting to fix <thank> you. <laughs> I have plastic. I don't. You <laughs> but that's even a good picture. How we don't even use money anymore. It's just plastic, and eventually it'll just be credits. Eventually they're going to get to be where we just have it. We swipe our arm, and that's how much points we have right now. So when it comes to the complexity of our mind, it's, I, I want to stop for a second, because even though they can't count change, holy mackerel, you can get a 20 year old to fly a jet that's got so many technological things in it and they know exactly what to do. So their focus is different. Counting <coughs> change is very simple, not needed, but the complex things they can master. So that's the thing that I'm seeing, the trend where our mind really doesn't need much emphasis on simplicity anymore. We're really focused on complexity. Think, think about this thing, a smartphone. So when, you, when we first had phones, you dial a number and you talk. Hey, how you doing? That was it. it was, we had nothing else on our cell phones. As a matter of fact, I had a cell phone. I had a Palm Pilot, which had my calendar on it, and then I had an iPod, which had my music. So I had three things that I carried around in my purse. Now I have one thing. And this does more things than I've ever, I don't even know what it does. Half the time I look at, what is that app for? But you know how they always say there's an app for that? There are. There are so many things that you can do on this one little piece. And the phones are getting smaller. Mine actually is larger because I have an extended battery on it. But there are these little tiny things right now. That's all they are. They're going to get smaller and smaller. Well, actually, the screens are going to get bigger now because we're all old and we can't see. <laughs> but the complexity of this is amazing. The first phone that came out, very simple. You can take it apart, put it back together. This, they make it so you can't even take it apart. <laughs> you got to take it to an expert. When we handle, oh, look, she's got a bigger one. <laughs> when we have complexity, we handle complexity so much better than simplicity, but yet some of us still desire simplicity. It's almost like we want to get over the hump of complexity. So going back to the idea of love, it seems like love is the point. Love is the one key that we're missing to help us transcend through the peduncle. That, that's what I would say. So if you would, Susan, go ahead and let's finish this video up. <coughs>
on a limitless surface. Perhaps nothing at all when we think of the extreme importance of the forces of compression that are brought about by the spherical shape of the Earth. The geometrical limitation of a planet closed like a giant molecule upon itself. This limited surface of the Earth causes a pressure buildup as population densities increase. Under this pressure, the human elements infiltrate more and more into each other, their minds mutually stimulated by proximity. So each person extends, little by little, the radius of his influence upon the Earth. Mankind, forced to develop in a confined area, has now found itself subjected to an intense pressure. This pressure, combined with the nature of our thinking souls to coalesce, causes the radio energies of consciousness to concentrate toward a sort of super-consciousness. The final unification of our planet is the natural culmination of a cosmic process of organization which has never deviated since those remote ages when our Earth was young. Mankind has cosmic roots. But how do we specifically define mankind? What are its deeper meanings? Rational man has existed on this Earth some two million years. And yet in the course of only a few generations, all kinds of economic and cultural links have been forged around us. And now they are multiplying at a rapidly increasing rate. Today it is the whole world which is needed to nourish each one of us. The Earth is not only becoming covered by innumerable grains of thought, but it is becoming encased in a single thinking envelope, which forms a single huge grain of thought. All of the individual particles of reflective thought grouping themselves together and reinforcing each other in a single unanimous reflection. Mankind a sort of collective human organism that is now forming a layer of thinking substance of planetary dimensions. A noosphere that develops and intertwines its fibers to reinforce all men in the living unity of one single tissue. The noosphere comprises a single closed system in which each thinking element experiences for itself the same thing as all others. Megasynthesis, the sum total of all human beings. And so we see that no restricted group of men can evolve and grow except in cooperation with all other men. What more do we need to be convinced of the error hidden in the depths of any doctrine of isolation? The outcome of the world the gates to the future, the entry into the superhuman, these are not thrown open to a privileged few, nor one chosen people to the exclusion of all others. Rather, they will be opened to an advance of all together, in a direction in which all together can unite and find completion in a spiritual renewal of the earth. Man can hope for no evolutionary future except in association with all other men. What is the result of human works if not to create in and through each of us a supremely original center in which the universe uniquely reflects itself? And these centers are our very selves and personalities. Resonance to the all and expectation and awareness of a great presence. Are we not experiencing the preliminary symptoms of a still higher state? A deep harmony between two realities that seek each other? Let us sum up the situation thus far. 
20th century man has evolved from the stuff of the universe as we have seen, but has not yet completed his evolutionary process. He is, therefore, moving forward to some critical new point ahead. A.R. calls this the hyperpersonal. Yet how can a superconsciousness be associated with the collective all? The utter disproportion of the two seems to us, at first sight, almost laughable. How can the person and the all possibly be one and the same? But let us take a second look. We have seen and admitted that space-time is divergent as seen from the present standpoint of science. That is to say, one looked at only from the without. However, when we take the within into account, we see that the enormous layers of evolution must converge somewhere ahead to what Teilhard calls Omega, or more correctly, a point Omega. And this Omega point fuses and consumes all these layers completely in itself. What lies beyond the Omega point is then essentially beyond time and space altogether. Omega is a distinct center, a super consciousness, radiating to and through a system of centers. It is a grouping in which the personalization of the all and the personalizations of the human elements simultaneously and without merging attain their maximum potential under the influence of a supremely autonomous focus of union. Thus it is that space and time become truly humanized, or more correctly, superhumanized. The more other they become in the process of uniting, the more they discover themselves as self. Since they are steeped in Omega, these centers of consciousness can become whole only by super-centralizing themselves. The very seat of our consciousness, and that is the essence which Omega, to be truly Omega, must reclaim. Yet to communicate itself, ego must exist by continually abandoning itself, or the gift will fade away. But where has it been written that he who loses his soul shall save it? It is only through this apparent sacrifice that we can achieve the high peak of personality we have thought we must renounce. The convergence of a conscious universe would be inconceivable if it did not reassemble in itself all individual centers of human consciousness as well as all the consciousness throughout all nature. And at the end of the process, each individual human consciousness still remains conscious of itself. Furthermore, and it is crucial that we understand this point, each consciousness becomes even more itself, and thus more clearly distinct from others. The nearer it gets to all the others, at the Omega point. And that's it. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's more slides. Yeah, let, just let it run through. To discover the key to our survival, it now becomes imperative that we identify, harness, and develop those energies of the noosphere which are of an intercentric nature, that is, center to center, or soul to soul, not just mind to mind. This brings us to the problem of love which Teilhard defines as cosmic energy. Love, the affinity of being with being, is not peculiar to man. 
It is a universal property of all life and thus embraces all forms of organized matter. If there were no internal tendency to unite, even at a rudimentary level, as for example the attraction of atom to atom, molecule to molecule, or cell to cell, love could not appear at a higher level within us. Recognizing the presence of love in ourselves, we must, as we did with consciousness, presume its presence in everything that is. The forces of love drive the fragments of the universe to seek each other so that the world may come into being. If this is so, love in all its subtle varieties is radio energy. Thus Omega, by partially immersing itself into the heart of each element, draws the universe into psychical convergence to itself. Teilhard says that love is the fundamental impulse of life. Or to put it another way, love is the only natural medium in which the upward course of evolution can proceed. It is through love and within love that we must search for our deepest self in the life-giving coming together of humankind. Love is the free and imaginative outflowing of the spirit over all unexplored paths. It links those who love in bonds that unite but do not destroy, causing them to discover in their mutual contact an exaltation capable of stirring in the very core of their being all that they possess of uniqueness and of creative power. Love alone can unite living beings so as to complete and fulfill them, for it alone joins them by what is deepest in themselves. All we need is to imagine our ability to love developing until it embraces the totality of man and of the earth. Yet is it not really impossible to love everything and everyone. Well, Teilhard tells us that this is not as preposterous as it first seems, for it is achievable, but only through cosmic love. Not only is a universal or cosmic love psychologically possible, it constitutes the only complete and final way in which we are capable of loving. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. This is the greatest commandment. It comes first, but the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or to paraphrase, love each other, recognizing the same God who is being born in each one of you. These words, uttered some 2,000 years ago, now begin to unveil themselves as the indispensable structural law of what we call evolution. Hence, they enter the scientific field of cosmic energy and its essential laws. We have seen that the rise of consciousness has been dependent on the physical Earth. Because the Omega Point transcends both time and space, Evolution cannot reach fulfillment on Earth, except through a point of dissociation. And yet ahead of us, we now see that there is a psychical center which is gathering together the final surge of consciousness. Thus we are introduced to what Teilhard says is an inevitable and fantastic event now starting to take form an event which comes closer with each passing day, the end of all life on our Earth, the death of the physical planet, the final stage of the phenomenon of man. Catastrophic end of the world, sidereal cataclysm through cosmic mishap, onslaughts of microbes, counter-evolution, sterility, nuclear war, or 
ever slow death in our earthly prison, a long drawn out senility. Each of these represents a perfectly plausible way of coming to an end. Teilhard further states emphatically, however, that on the basis of all we know from evolution, we have nothing whatsoever to fear from any premature accident or failure. We have higher reasons for being certain that they will not occur. The presence of reflection in the universe would be incomprehensible if the infinite and the infinitesimal did not conspire to nourish and sustain to the very end the consciousness that has arisen between the two. How then could man come to an end before his biologically appointed hour or deteriorate unless the world aborts itself? Thus we conclude that man will attain the goal, however improbable it might appear to us. Mankind has extraordinary possibilities ahead of it. Since crossing the threshold of reflection, we have entered a completely new phase of evolution. Thanks to the powerful capacity of reflective thought to gather together and combine into one conscious effort all the individual human particles. We are faced with a sort of collective exaltation, human vibrations resonating by the million. An entire layer of consciousness bringing pressure to bear simultaneously on the future and on the whole storehouse of a million years of thought. Have we ever attempted to realize what such magnitudes represent? when under this increasing psychical tension on the surface of the earth, enough elements have been grouped together, evolution will reach such intensity and such quality that the whole of mankind will be compelled to reflect upon itself at a single point. In other words, the movement will forsake its earthly foothold so as to pivot itself on its transcendent center. This will be the termination and the fulfillment of the spirit of the earth. The end of the world, the total internal introversion upon itself of the noosphere that has simultaneously attained the furthest limit of its complexity and consciousness in an ecstasy utterly transcending the entire length, breadth, and depth of the visible universe. The end of the world, the upset of equilibrium, releasing the mind from its material matrix so that fulfilled at long last, it will center itself thereafter with all its weight in God. existed. As a matter of fact, they're doing a film, they're building, creating a project right now on a film of Teilhard and this information, so there'll probably be a new film out. It's going to be a television series. It's in production right now. They're looking to release it in 24, 2015, or in 2014, right? 2015. <clears throat> the concept of this, though, started way back in the 70s. Uh, NASA, there was a NASA engineer who uh, worked with Jet Propulsion. I, I think he worked on the Jet Propulsion side. His name was uh, Harry Olson. George met Harry Olson at one of the meetings that he used to have here before he started Omega. And Harry Olson actually handed off this material to George and said, we're going bankrupt. We don't have the funding. You take it. 
and pretty much gave it to George. So that's why George has a lot of this material. And then I guess some of the board members kind of resumed and they are, they've been revisiting the uh, Phenomenon of Man project. There is a center in New York called the Omega, I think it's just called the Omega Center. And they actually do a lot of J Arts work there as well. And I remember when I first became involved in Omega, my family naturally, because they're all from New York, like, oh, is this the same thing? Can we go here? And I'm like, no, it's different. <laughs> so the idea where he talks about love, love one another, and how love is what increases our complexity, it bonds us together and will help us move forward, that's what inspired him towards the Omega Point, which is what George really wanted to call this, but he couldn't because there was another organization already called the Omega Point in California. So he went the idea of Omega Vector, Vector is direction. So we're in the direction of Omega, the consciousness evolution sh shifting our awareness. And naturally, as I've already mentioned, the goal in the classroom is to shift the group awareness to a, another awareness within itself, to raise your consciousness and to produce self-reliant individuals. So I know that this, uh, as I said earlier, Teilhard was a priest who tried to incorporate religion and science together. And I think he did a fairly good job once you understand this. I'll tell you, when I first saw this, so much of it went over my head. Well, because I kept sleeping in between it. But back in the 80s, I think it was when George first showed this, I didn't get half of it. It wasn't until recently or the, like, I don't know, maybe four or five years later when I saw it again, I went, oh, I get it. And then, of course, revisiting it again, like today, it's like, oh, now I understand all the different connections. So it's kind of like anything. You have to see it more once, twice, three times, and then you kind of understand the process. Well, at least for me, that's what happens. So evolution. I had an evolution of my brain. I need to see something four times before I actually get it. And I went through a pedunkel and now it's part of me, so I, I understand it. I wanted to take it as an opportunity, like I said, I wanted to be able to just deliver what inspired George so much. And those of you who knew George, he was a very scientific individual. So this really, he really gravitated to this information as well. I'm grateful I was able to be able to present this to you and give you the original books. And like I said, if you're curious, they're working on the Phenomenon of Man project and it should be released on a, on a TV series, but there's a website. If you just go to Teilhard de Chardin, you'll go to a website and it's not complete obviously because they're still working on it, but there's a little bit of background on him and Wikipedia has some information on him as well. Any questions before we, and please don't have any questions about the information, any questions <laughs> before we finish? Well, I wanted to take a little bit of time towards the end here because I know that, um, you know, with the announcement of the closing of our doors, what's the next step and what are our plans? Most of my focus right now has been on presenting. Yes, sir. I had a question. Like when we release uh, all this loving consciousness, are we creating an energy or are we just tapping into it? The, the, the love consciousness type of thing. Or is, are we, the love is in the, the, the energy of the universe. Love is in the air. In the love. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lewis, I'm going to say that we're tapping into it because if everything already exists, I'm going to say the love already exists as an entity. So we're challenging we would be it, tapping into it, it and channeling it through. Okay. I'm going to say that's a safe bet, but I can't give you a yes, this is the definite answer. My opinion would be we're tapping into it. When I think about love, it grows within me. Where it comes from, I don't know. So I'm assuming it must already be somewhere to excel within me. So have you ever had the experience of like sitting in front of your wife and you feel overjoyed and overwhelmed with her? Well, that experience is already within you and it just seems to grow. So it existed already. So that's why I think it means we're tapping into it. Would that satisfy you? Maybe tapping into something. And then the reverse would be true. So hatred would already exist and we would be tapping into that energy as well. I'm, I'm gonna say everything exists already. We just seem to be tapping into it. It just changes in complexity. 
So the love for atoms and cells is far different than the love of human beings have. Yeah, I got myself into that one a bit. All right, any other questions? <laughs> All right, so then let me just briefly give a synopsis of what the deal is for Omega. Uh, what we're planning on is uh, have uh, an Omega one that starts this Thursday, and then there's a Monday night workshop following that. There's a, actually tomorrow, um, Monday, okay. is a Back to Basics program. Then comes the Omega one, then there's a Monday night workshop, and then one final Back to Basics program, and that's it. So May is the last things we'll have. There's been some scuttlebutt about maybe not having a building soon, so we've checked to see and if the building does go in foreclosure, it's at least 90 days. So we'll have at least 90 days to get out of here before everything collapses and falls in and we run and scream and go to the next peduncle. <laughs> so um, my plan right now is I haven't put anything thought process in mind of the procedure once the programs are done, but June is the month that we'll be working on that. So we'll be looking for volunteers to help us start packing things up. We want to inventory things, get rid of items that we're not going to be re reusing when we open up, we may not need to have everything that we have right now. So minimal amount is what we want to take with us. And then we'll have a final liquidation sale where we'll hopefully gain some more money to help sustain us until we open up back again. And then on the 28th, which is the day George passed away in 2012, we thought it would be a nice way to honor um, a final open doors, say goodbye, come feel the room, tell stories of when you sat and cried in the classrooms and how George scared you or I scared you. And, <laughs> and that would be it. So we're looking to be out of here by the end of June. And then as far as the next process, just stay tuned to the newsletter. I have things in the work right now, but I'm not prepared to release them just yet. So um, over the next couple of weeks, you'll start hearing things about what I'm planning on doing in the interim of what Omega will be doing. I've had several requests for study groups. I've had several requests for continuing workshops or newsletters and stuff like that. So I'm managing what to do in that essence. But the energy of Omega, since you've just watched this, we would like to push it into a peduncle. So close it now and transform it into the next level. That's what we're uh, shooting for. So since you're still around, it would be helpful if we had people come and help us uh, pack and whatnot. And then also, of course, we have our last program this weekend, next weekend coming up. So I really would encourage you all to come down for the last graduation in the building as well. We'll have the room, we'll have, be in this room. I think we're up to 30 people now on the list. There might be a little bit more than that. So that'll be nice to have a nice a final group back up to the numbers that we used to have. When I went through the program, we had 80, 100 people in our classes. So we haven't had that in a long time. But it's been a while since we've had about 40 people in here. And I'd, I'd like to have that again. That would be a nice goal. So get your friends and loved ones to come in or come back again. <laughs> well, thanks for taking your Saturday mornings to come down here and explore the phenomenon of man. I look forward to seeing you the next time you're here. Have a good rest of your weekend. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there. Bye now.